In the past half century, we've seen many dates proposed predicting the end of the world and other cataclysmic events. 1966, 1982, 1994, 1996, 2000, 2011, and now 2012. Specifying a particular date for a future event creates a magic of anticipation that helps to align expectations toward that particular focus, creating a certain degree of self-fulfilling prophecy, depending on how many people believe in it. As the popular mythology and anticipation around the year 2012 builds, with hopeful speculations and dire predictions, ranging from Judgment Day to the destruction of the planet, magical people around the world are focusing on the pivotal moment of winter solstice to catalyze a global awakening of planetary consciousness. The 1960 movie, The Time Machine, produced by George Powell and based on the 1895 novel by H.G. Wells, predicted a global nuclear holocaust on August 19, 1966, that date appearing on the Time Traveler's dashboard chronometer. In 1960, the Damoclean threat of a nuclear apocalypse seemed so imminent that dating it only six years later seemed perfectly reasonable. Indeed, at that time, virtually all prognostications assumed that civilization would soon be destroyed in a thermonuclear war, and we'd all end up slugging it out with hideous mutants in the radioactive ruins. This was the essential plot of nearly every science fiction movie and numerous episodes of The Twilight Zone. But that didn't happen. Instead, something very different transpired in 1966 as the new TV series Star Trek premiered on September 8th of that year, inserting a hopeful future vision into what had essentially been a blank page. Star Trek's creator, Gene Roddenberry, is said to have explained his intention as, I'm trying to present a new vision of the future that will be so compelling that people will choose it over a global nuclear holocaust. And so he did. 46 years later, six TV series and 11 movies have created a different future that has inspired our imagination and technology towards interracial harmony, the personal computer revolution, and the exploration of space, and given us the greatest mission statement of all time, to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Right. Don't get better than that, does it? The next major projection of the future came a year later, in 1967, with the hit Broadway play and movie Hair. This was the vision of the age of Aquarius, when peace will rule the planets and love will steer the stars. And harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding, no more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of visions, mystic crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius, Aquarius. The 12 astrological ages, or eons, mark divisions of the 25,920 year precessional cycle of the Earth's rotational axis in a vast circle around the heavens, heavenly constellation of Draco, the dragon. Just as we mark a clock face on a calendar into 12 equal hours or months for the purpose of timekeeping, so did ancient Babylonian astronomers in the second millennium BCE devise the zodiacal calendar, naming its 12 divisions for the constellations in the plane of the ecliptic, the plane in which all the planets revolve around the sun. Although the zodiacal constellations are various sizes, the 12 divisions of the zodiac are all the same length, which is 30 degrees. One complete period a precession of the equinoxes through all 12 signs of the zodiac is called a great year, or platonic year, of 25,920 years. Each zodiacal age of 30 degrees therefore lasts 2,160 years, and is marked by which constellation the sun appears to rise at dawn of the vernal equinox. The past 2,000 plus years have been the age of Pisces, named for the constellation of Pisces, the fish. The next age will be that of Aquarius, the water bearer. Different astrologers have proposed different dates for the dawning of the age of Aquarius. The next significant future date was 1982. In 1974, The Jupiter Effect, a best-selling book by John Gribben and Stephen Plegeman, 
predicted that an alignment of the planets on March 10th of 82 would create a widespread catastrophe as on Earth, including a massive earthquake along the San Andreas Fault. Although many people, myself included, got caught up in the paranoia around that date, when it finally came, nothing much happened. Another legendary date was 1984. George Orwell's dystopian vision of a totalitarian world government and perpetual war. Orwell wrote the book in 1948, and he just transposed the last two digits. But alarmingly, the book became a blueprint for a political world uncannily similar to many of its most dire projections. Then came 1987 and the Harmonic Convergence, the world's first globally synchronized meditation on August 16th and 17th, when an exceptional alignment of planets occurred in the solar system. This event had originally been predicted by Tony Shearer in his 1971 book, Lord of the Dawn. According to this interpretation of Mayan cosmology, the date marked the end of 22 cycles of 52 years each, or 1,144 years in all. And these 22 cycles were divided into 13 heaven cycles, which began in the year 843 and ended in 1519, when the nine hell cycles began, ending 468 years later in 1987. The nine hell cycles commenced on precisely the day that Cortez landed in Mexico, April 22nd, 1519. This date corresponds to the date one read on the Aztec Mayan calendar. So the nine hell cycles of 52 years each ended precisely on August 16th, 17th of 1987. And on that date, many people congregated at power centers such as Mount Shasta and Mount Fuji, where the spiritual energy was particularly strong. The belief then was that if 144,000 people assembled at these power centers and meditated for peace, the arrival of the new era of world peace would be facilitated. And it worked. That year, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev introduced a major policy reform known as perestroika, restructuring, overhauling the entire Soviet political and economic system. This caused the dissolution of the Soviet Union, revolutions in Eastern Europe, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and the end of the Cold War. According to the book of Genesis, the Lord created the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So the idea of cycles of seven became deeply embedded in Judeo-Christian mythology, as in seven days of the week, seven planets, seven alchemical metals, seven archangels, and many other correspondences of seven. It became popular to equate the seven days of creation with 7,000 year periods of human history. Based on the second Peter 3.8, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. The idea was that there would be 6,000 years of history from creation onward, at the end of which would have come the apocalyptic battle of Armageddon, in which armies of angels would contend with and defeat armies of devils, and the world would be destroyed, devastated. After that, the Lord would create a new heaven and a new earth. The faithful would be resurrected to inherit the reconstructed earth, the Messiah would return to rule from heaven, and the next thousand years would be known as the millennium, thousand years. After this interim golden age of paradise on earth would come the final judgment and the eternal bliss of the blessed elect. So the, cru the crucial question became, what was the starting date for Genesis? The most widely accepted date, printed for centuries in most Bibles, was determined by James Usher, Church of Ireland Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of all Ireland between the years 1625 and 1656. Bishop Usher labored over biblical genealogies and came up with a date for creation of October 22nd, 4004 BC. E. 6,000 years from that date would take us to October 22nd of 1996. But when the fateful day of the apocalypse finally rolled around, nothing much happened. A Baptist preacher named William Miller predicted that the second advent of Jesus Christ would occur on or before March 21st, 1844. 
When this date passed, a new date was predicted of April 18th, the same year. Again the date passed, and Miller's disciple Samuel Snow came up with a revised date of October 22nd that year. The unfulfillment of these predictions became known as the Millerite Great Disappointment. Yes, they were actually disappointed that the world didn't end. Russian Mennonite minister Klaus Epp Jr. predicted that Christ would return on March 8th of 1889. And when that date passed uneventfully, he rescheduled it for 1891. <laughs> Still nothing. Harold Camping, as an American Christian radio broadcaster and president of Family Radio, which broadcast to more than 150 markets in the U.S. In 1992, he published a book titled 1994, in which he predicted the Christian apocalypse in September of that year. Needless to say, it didn't happen. In 1970, Camping had dated the biblical deluge to 4,990 BCE. Using this date, taken from that same statement from Genesis, seven days from now I will send rain upon the earth to be a prediction of the end of the world and combining it with that line from 2 Peter about the thousand years being a day, Camping concluded the end of the world would occur in the year 2011, 7,000 years from 4990 BCE. Camping took the 17th day of the second month mentioned in Genesis 7:11 to be May 21st, and hence predicted the rapture and judgment day on that date and the end of the world on October 21st. When those days came, guess what? Nothing much happened. And Harold and his chagrined followers are still here. Christianity has always had a streak of millennial fever. At the end of the first millennium, approaching the year 1000, there was widespread fear throughout Christendom and reports of divine omens, such as wars and rumors of wars, famines, plagues, comets, and eclipses, heralding the end of the world. Although Christian millennialism is the most well-known example of a millenarian belief system, the application of thousand-year cycles to major transition of the world has occurred in many cultures and religions back for many thousands of years and continues to this day. And not only among religions. Witness the worldwide panic regarding Y2K, the year 2000, and predictions that a millennial bug in the programming unable to adjust computer dating to a new century would devastate computer systems and the internet. As usual, nothing much happened. The 1968 movie by Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey, predicted that by that year, we would have a lunar base, passenger space shuttles to a wheel-shaped space station hotel, sentient computers, video phones, cryogenic suspension, and a manned expedition to Jupiter, Saturn in the book version, we would make our first contact with alien intelligence. Now, 11 years later, we at least have the video phones. <laughs> the rest we're still waiting for. And in 1984, Clark and Kubrick produced the sequel, Odyssey 2, The Year We Make Contact. This one was set two years ago in 2010. The Soviet Union, which actually collapsed in 1989, was still a superpower when Jupiter was ignited into a new mini-sun and all its moons, except Europa, which had its own life and destiny, were open to imminent human colonization. Right. In the popular Terminator franchise of movies and TV series, with the first film released in 1984, Judgment Day is the date in which a US strategic defense computer called Skynet becomes self-aware and decides to exterminate mankind. Due to the element of time travel and the consequent ability to change the future, several dates are given for Judgment Day during the franchise. These, these range from August 29th, 1997 to July 25th, 2004. And in the most recent one, the, um, com the Day of Judgment was postponed to April 21st, 2011, due to the attack on Cyberdyne systems in Terminator 2. The passing of the final date for Judgment Day of April 21st of last year prompted BBC News to pose the question, how close were the Terminator films to the reality of 2011? Comparing how far present day technology and society had developed compared to the predictions of the franchise. And then of course, 
It was the second Back to the Future movie released in 1989 and set only three years from now, in 2015, when we will have flying cars powered by fusion engines and time travel. I can hardly wait. <laughs> All of which brings us to winter solstice, December 21st of this year, 2012, and the end of the Mayan calendar. What does this mean for us? Is this going to be just another in a long line of failed prophecies of the end of the world? Or is it perhaps, rather, the beginning of something? In their 1969 book, Hamlet's Mill, Giorgio di Santillana and Hertha von Deschen proposed a cosmological significance to the legendary mill or lathe of heaven recorded in the ancient sagas of the Gesta Danorum and the Finnish Kalevala, as well as the Hindu creation myth of the churning of the sea of milk that separated the lands, the curds, from the waters, the way. The spindle of this metaphorical cosmic mill is the rotational axis of the earth, which runs through the center of the earth from pole to pole and extends from the earth's north pole to Polaris, the North Star. This is also the trunk of the great world tree and the Norse, uh, and the, and the, that the Norse call Yggdrasil. But there is also another important axis of the entire solar system represented by the poles of the ecliptic, which extends perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic from the center of the sun to the constellation of Draco. Due to the imbalance of the seas and continents, the rotating Earth wobbles slightly on its axis, like a top that is running down. This wobble causes the position of the Earth's north polar axis to describe a slow circle through the heavens around the stationary pole of the ecliptic at a latitude of 23.5 degrees, the angle at which the Earth's axis is inclined or tipped relative to the plane of the ecliptic. South of the ecliptic pole in Draco. This corresponds to the latitude of the Arctic Circle, the location at which the midnight sun circles the horizon without setting on winter solstice. On the edge of the Arctic Circle, just off the coast of Norway, at Greenwich longitude 1 degree 15 minutes east, is the location of the Moskenstroman, or Maelstrom, the legendary gigantic whirlpool described in the 13th century Norse Eddas. The Swedish bishop Olus Magnus included the Moskenstroman in his 1539 map, Carta Marina. It was exaggerated by Edgar Allan Poe in his 1841 short story, A Descent into the Maelstrom, and in Jules Verne's 1870 novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and it also featured prominently in the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie. <laughs> An actual system of tidal eddies and whirlpools, one of the strongest in the world, this is the actual place where the spindle of the ecliptic pole churns the earthly waters of the cosmic mill. The precession of the equinoxes is most readily noted by the day of the vernal equinox shifting backwards over time through all the signs of the zodiac, a band of 12 constellations along the perimeter of the plane of the ecliptic. As the Earth's axis circles Draco, different stars in turn become the pole star. Now it is Polaris. In 3000 BC, it was Thuban. 4,000 years from now, it will be in Cepheus, Another 5,000 years, and Deneb will be the pole star. And 4,000 years after that, it will be Vega. In the year 24,000, it will be back to Thuban. And finally, 26,000 years from now, Polaris will again be the pole star. This phenomenon is called the precession of the equinoxes. And it takes exactly 25,920 years to complete the circle. Thus, that period is divided into 12 astrological ages, or eons, of 30 degrees, or 2,167 years, marked by the two points on opposite sides of the year, where the extension of the Earth's equator, called the celestial equator, intersects the plane of the ecliptic. These points are the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, meaning equal night, and the zodiacal constellations in which the sun appears to rise on that day in spring, give us the names and symbolism of the eons. For the past 2,160 years, the vernal equinox has occurred in Pisces the fish, and so we've considered this to have been the age of Pisces, 
also known as the Christian era. And synchronistically, the symbol of the fish was adopted by early Christians as a logo because the Greek word for fish served as an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. But the vernal equinox has been slowly moving at the rate of one degree every 72 years towards the next constellation in turn, which is Aquarius. And now it is directly on the cusp. But in addition to the celestial equator of the Earth and the ecliptic equator of the solar system, there is yet a third significant equatorial plane to consider, the plane of the disc-shaped Milky Way galaxy, which appears to us as a great milky band around the night sky. And just as the Earth's equator intersects with that of the solar system at the spring and fall equinoxes, so does the ecliptic equator intersect with that of the galaxy at two points. Ancient astronomers noted these two points, one in the northern sky at the cusp of Gemini and Taurus, and the other in the southern sky at the cusp of Sagittarius and Scorpio. These are the galactic equinoxes, and it was commonly believed that these two points were gateways through which souls passed into and out of our world from the heavens. Microbius, in the late 4th century, describes this in some detail. He says, The Milky Way girdles the zodiac, its great circle meeting it obliquely so that it crosses at the two tropical signs of Gemini and Sagittarius. Natural philosophers named these the portals of the sun because the solstices lie athwart the sun's path on either side, checking further progress and causing it to retrace its course across the belt beyond. Souls are believed to pass through these portals when going from the sky to the earth and returning from the earth to the sky. Because of the precessional cycle, the solstices have been slipping backwards through the zodiac, just as the equinoxes have. Winter solstice of this year will occur precisely at the point where the plane of the ecliptic intersects the galactic equator at the cusp of Sagittarius and Scorpio. And a straight line through this point aligns directly with the immense black hole at the center of our galaxy, 26,000 light years away, against which the solstice sun will rise. If we were sitting in a boat on the Arctic Circle, just off the coast of Norway at the location of the legendary Maelstrom, Greenwich longitude, one degree, 15 minutes east, at noon of December 21st, 2012, we would see the 12 constellations of the zodiac distributed all around the horizon. Directly overhead would be the ecliptic north pole. Due south, the sun would appear on the horizon aligned with the center of the galaxy at the Sagittarius portal, the Golden Gate. Opposite on the north horizon would be the Gemini portal, the Silver Gate. The great star-strewn path of the Milky Way would span the sky like a bridge between these portals, and the sun would circle the horizon clockwise, passing through each sign of the zodiac every two hours. At midnight, the sun would stand before the Silver Gate. This winter solstice, the intersection of the plane of the ecliptic with the galactic equator will form a great cosmic cross with the sun in the center, positioned precisely over the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Many ancients called the Milky Way the way of the dead, the road on which souls travel between lives from one gate to another in preparation for rebirth. The dark path of dust that forms a line from galactic center towards the North Star was called Zibalba by the ancient Mayans, the dark underworld realm of the dead, which corresponded to an actual labyrinthine complex of limestone caverns underlying their homeland on the Yucatan Peninsula. The Mayans believe that this cosmic alignment will thus open a stargate to the afterworld, and all beings will transition via that path to a new phase of spiritual evolution. Their intricate long count calendar therefore assigns to this date the end of the fifth world age, or sun. In Western terms, this cosmological event marks the end of the Piscean age and the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And the prophesied new phase of spiritual evolution can only be the awakening of planetary consciousness, the awakening of Gaia herself. The ancient Mayans called the days kins, and they organized these into multiples or factors of 13 and 20, important numbers in the Mayan sacred numerology. 
In the Mayan long count calendar developed around 355 BCE, 20 kins were grouped into a cycle called a uanil. 18 uanils comprised a ton or year, the only cycle in the Mayan long count system that did not utilize numbers 13 or 20 or any of their multiples or factors. A ton less than 360 days, a bit short of a 365.25 day solar year. 20 tons constitute a cycle called a katun, and 20 katuns comprised a baktun, and 13 baktuns made up a great world age or sun of 5,200 tons or 5,126 solar years. The present Mayan world age began on the date of August 11th in the Gregorian calendar year of 3,114 BCE, considered by the Mayans as day one of the first Bakhtun, and is scheduled to end on December 21st, 2012, the final day of the 13th Bakhtun. Furthermore, the ancient Mayans considered the enormous 5,200 ton long period of time as a segment in an even larger cycle composed of five of these world ages spanning nearly 26,000 years, solar years. From the date in one era on which the winter solstice sunrise appears to conjunct exactly with the dead center of the Milky Way galaxy and the next era in which the same astronomical phenomenon occurs again due to the precession of the equinoxes. The Mayans calculated correctly that this occurrence would repeat every 26,000 tons or 25,630 years. Cuban Taino shaman Miguel Sagay puts it like this. Coincidentally, there are several other facts concerning the Milky Way galaxy that relate to this enormous period of time. It takes approximately 26,000 years for light emitted at the bright glowing center of the galaxy to reach the Earth. The light that arrives on Earth from the heart of the galaxy, the heart of heaven, is a vehicle transmitter of important cosmic spiritual information which originates at the very center of the universe itself. This information is most likely coded in binary language. It is understood by some researchers that this binary code information is further translated and decoded by passing through the solar orb. That can only happen at moments of alignment when the galaxy, the sun, and the earth are perfectly in line with each other. And those rare moments, there is a concise focusing and perfect interpretation of the vital information originating at the center of the universe, which is being transmitted through the heart of the galaxy, and from there through the center of the sun, and then finally to the earth. An alignment of this kind is scheduled to occur on the Gregorian date, December 21st, in the year 2012. This kind of winter solstice alignment only takes place once every 260 centuries. Human art appeared on the scene with a bang, as far as the archeological record is concerned, some 30,000 years ago. There is nothing to foreshadow its emergence, no sign of crude beginnings. That's a line from a book called The Creative Explosion by John E. Pfeiffer. The last age of Aquarius which began in the Upper Paleolithic 26,000 years ago, has been called the creative explosion, when humanity experienced an unprecedented emergence and proliferation of art and culture, remnants of which still astound us today in the form of exquisite cave paintings, engravings, and sculptures. These include animals, human figures, animal-human hybrids, handprints, abstracts, signs, and symbols, especially vulvas. And foremost and iconic among these are the countless small sculptures of lush female forms in every conceivable material, stone, bone, ivory, and fired clay. Doubtless, there were originally many carved of wood as well, painted on animal hides and woven into basketry designs, but none of those could have survived to the present time. What is most distinctive about these plump little female figurines is the commonality of style, regardless of the medium. They stand with knees together and tiny feet slightly apart. Upper arms and elbows are against the sides, and the thin forearms and hands, when they are indicated at all, curl up and over the prominent breasts. Their proportions are those of a woman looking down over her own body, with no correction for perspective distortion, so the feet appear attenuated and insignificant while the breasts and belly predominate. 
of a size and shape to be held comfortably in one hand, they were invariably faceless, indicating they were not portraits of particular women, but rather of a generic archetype. Spanning a period of time from around 30,000 years ago to the end of the last ice age, 10,500 years ago, hundreds of them have been found from Spain to Siberia, and all are so similar in convention and style as to have been made by the same artist. The first Paleolithic female figurine was discovered in 1864 by the Marquis de Vibray at an archaeological dig in Dodorne, France. Evidently assuming such images were made by men as erotic fetishes or idealizations of beauty, Vibray named his find the Venus, imprudent, immodest Venus, in contrast to the modest Venus Pudica of ancient Greece. The term stuck and such figures have been popularly called Venuses ever since. But I much prefer the term coined by Maria Gambudis, matrikas, or little mothers. For it seems evident to me that they were made by women and represented the archetypal source of all fertility and life, the mother of all mothers, the great mother, Mother Earth. Here's another line from Miguel Saguet. Through the use of music, dance, painting, drawing, sculpture, drama, poetry, and storytelling, shamanism became the first form of media, and its message was the content of the profound covenant that had been forged between humanity and the sacred spirit of Earth Mother in the year 24,000 BCE. Gaia, or Mother Earth, is the oldest and most universally acknowledged religious archetype in all of human experience intuitively recognized throughout the world even by small children. 42 years ago, I had a revelatory vision that eventually became known as the Gaia Thesis, that all life on Earth comprises the body of a single vast living being, Mother Earth, Gaia herself. What we call evolution has been nothing less than embryology on a planetary scale. And in positing Gaia as a single vast planetary organism, we cannot avoid the implication that such a complex entity must also possess a concomitant awareness, sentience, indeed, consciousness. To understand the nature of Gaia, let us explore how our own bodies come into being. We begin as a single fertilized cell, a zygote, through which, conti which through continuous mitotic divisions and subdivisions becomes the myriad cells eventually comprising an adult body. Now when a cell reproduces, the mother cell does not remain intact, but actually becomes the two new daughter cells. Since the same protoplasm is present in the daughter cells as was in the mother cell, the two daughter cells still comprise but a single organism, one living being. Thus the several trillion cells of the adult human body continue to comprise a single living organism. Even though different cells may be highly specialized in various organs and tissues, and some may even be mobile enough to travel around independently within the body. No matter how complex the final form of the adult organism, no matter how diversified its component cells, the same thread of life of the original cell, the same DNA, the same protoplasm, continues coursing through every cell in that body. Tracing our evolution back to the Cambrian explosion 544 million years ago, through mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and so on, we eventually wind up with one single cell that was the ancestor of all life on the present Earth. Scientists refer to this cell as LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. That original cell, the first to develop the awesome capacity for reproduction, divided and redistributed its protoplasm and DNA into the myriad plants and animals, including us. For when this original mother cell reproduced itself and continued to do so for eons, its daughter cells mutating and evolving into new forms, it still, as in the human body, continued to comprise but a single total organism. When a cell divides and subdivides, no matter how often, the same DNA, the same protoplasm, the same life passes into the daughter cells and the granddaughter cells and the great-granddaughter cells forever. Thus, the aggregate total of the new cells continues to comprise 
one single living organism. Evolution is but the embryology of the planetary creature who has since ancient times been identified as Mother Earth. This is an obvious extension of the biogenic law originally proposed by Ernst Haeckel in uh, 1919, who believed he had discovered the most basic law of evolution. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, or the development of an embryo, ontology, is a speeded up replay of the evolution of the species, phylogeny. It was an enormously influential idea, utilized both by both Darwin and Huxley, who were impressed with Heckel's detailed illustrations comparing embryological development and various animals and man. This recapitulation theory enjoyed a tremendous vogue for a few decades, shaping scientific thought of the period, including the psychoanalytic theories of Sigmund Freud. John C., the founder of the Rainforest Information Center, says, the Gaia idea is not an hypothesis, but just the truth in front of everybody's face. The Earth is a single living organism, and all the pieces of Earth, like ourselves, are cells in the living body of the Earth, and they are the life support systems. For I am the soul of nature that gives life to the universe. From me all things proceed, and unto me all things must return. That's Doreen Valiente's Charge of the Goddess. The single most characteristic aspect of any living organism is a discrete awareness or sentience through which it seeks food, avoids discomfort, pursues a reproductive strategy, and makes innumerable choices between this and that in the course of its life. Such sentience pervades every living creature, distinguishes an entity from an object, and drives the very heart of evolution. The more complex the organism, the more attention seems to be focused on organs of perception and sentience. 19th century paleontologist Arthur March articulated this observation in the form of Marsh's Law. Any evolutionary line of warm-blooded animals exhibits over time a steady increase of relative brain size, and therefore of consciousness. If we are willing to posit Gaia as a single vast planetary organism, we cannot avoid the acknowledgement that such a complex organism must perforce also possess a concomitant global awareness, sentience, indeed consciousness. The intrinsic spirituality found among all peoples is rooted in an apprehension of a coexistent and pervasive realm of gods and spirits. This universal animism, pantheism, and religious theology supports the thesis of sentience existing at scales beyond that of the human individual, just as our individual consciousnesses operate at a vaster synergic scale than that of our component neurons. The idea that all life or all consciousness is interconnected is one of humanity's most enduring spiritual traditions. Indeed, it is the very essence of what is called the perennial philosophy. It is a compelling idea, spanning both millennia and the vast complexity of human cultures. Carl Jung coined the term collective unconscious to refer to such a global mind, and Tyre de Chardin described it as a noosphere, a sheath of intelligence for the Earth and the inevitable extension of the planetary biosphere. But the true heart of this understanding is found in the alchemical, mystical concept of the anima mundi, the spirit of the Earth. This term is nothing less than a medieval rephrasing of the most ancient and primordial theological premise of the goddess as Mother Earth or Mother Nature. How then could such a global entity as the Earth Mother Goddess have been so apparently absent throughout the entire history of Western civilization? If such a planetary consciousness exists, how can we possibly fail to apprehend and experience it? Why don't we all hear her voice in our dreams and in the backs of our minds, as the ancients attest they did. For would not her global brain be comprised of our own, as our brains are comprised of billions of neurons? Princeton research psychologist Julian Jaynes presents a compelling thesis in his 1976 book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Since we have only one organ of vocalization, 
our cognitive functions are lateralized with the left hemispheres of our brain controlling the mouth and conscious thought. And there in the Wernicke's area of the posterior temporal lobe, right over our left ear, resides our individual conscious identities. James proposes that a completely independent cognitive mentality that developed in the corresponding region of the right cerebral hemisphere. Therein resided various cognitive functions now displayed only by our left hemisphere consciousness. These right hemisphere faculties made it possible for human societies to share communal awareness of a single transcorporeal deity, or even entire pantheons of such entities. Communication between the respective inhabitants of these bicameral hemispheres, just as in the remnant phenomenon of multiple personality syndrome, was conveyed through the anterior commissure in the form of what today we call auditory hallucinations, and what ancients called the voices of the gods. Neural pathways between the two hemispheres pass through the corpus callosum. Also known as the colossal commissure, this is a wide, flat bundle of neural fibers that connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres and facilitates interhemispheric communication. Thousands of years ago, Jane says, Gaia and all the pantheons of ancient deities had, as an abode and a means of expression, the right cerebral hemispheres of humanity. Says James, the language of men was involved with only one hemisphere in order to leave the other free for the language of the gods. Since at that time human consciousness was split into two separate manifestations, the human and the divine, James refers to it as the bicameral, two houses mind, and maintains that it was these divine voices which were responsible for the social control that enabled civilization to arise. Says James, the bicameral mind with its controlling gods was evolved as a final stage of the evolution of language, and in this development lies the origin of civilization. As collective consciousnesses, these deities were not only omniscient, but omnipresent and immortal, and the memories and wisdom they could be called upon to provide were those of the people, back to the dawn of time. Icons, idols, figurines, and other depictions of such deities that were ubiquitous in those times functioned almost as modern-day internet access devices. When you had a problem and you sought an answer, you would gaze into the eyes of the little figurine. And you would trace the lines of the inscribed spirals and whorls on her body. You would invoke the deity, offer a prayer, and the figurine would come to life, and the voice of the deity would be heard as if it was spoken into your left ear. And for 25,000 years, from their earliest appearance 30,000 years ago, virtually all of those figurines were female. Which means that the voices that were being heard, even by the men, were female voices, goddess voices. So why did people stop hearing the voice of the planet within themselves? Many have cited the discovery by men of paternity, the Kurgan invasions of old Europe, the appearance and elevation of male gods, and the rise of powerful kings such as Gilgamesh. Yet the Bronze Age, which followed many of these transitions, at least through the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, was still a golden age of civilization, and the Earth Mother was universally acknowledged. So now we come to the Clash of the Titans. In the year 1628 BCE, witnessed the most devastating sequence of cataclysmic events in human history. The volcanic island we now call Thera detonated with a force over 10 times that of Krakatoa in 1883, resulting in the complete destruction of the entire Aegean civilization based on Crete and the Cycladic Isles. Some settlements were buried under as much as 100 feet of ash Huge tsunamis drowned coastal Greece, Syria, and Egypt, and the volcano below the horizon was visible for hundreds of miles as a column of smoke by day and fire by night. It was the time recorded in the Bible as the Exodus and the ten plagues that beset Egypt and even the parting of the Red Sea were all due to those events. The devastation of volcanoes and earthquakes were exacerbated by meteor showers, a rain of fire and stones, 
A new God appeared on the scene who had never been known before. A God of destruction, of the storm and the thunder in the sky, who hurled flaming bolts of fire from behind the clouds. And these divine thunderbolts, when dug out of the craters they were found in, could be forged into invincible weapons. All of the early iron weapons which began the Iron Age 3,600 years ago were made of meteoric nickel iron. In the Indo-European language of the invading warriors, the word for iron and meteor is the same word, Aryan. The volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and meteorites that devastated cities and fields spared these nomadic Aryan horsemen of the steppes who swept down through the ruined cities. The temples of the goddess were burned and pillaged, their priestesses raped and murdered, the voices of the gods were stunned into gibbering babble, and finally into silence. The golden age of bronze was overthrown by a dark age of iron. Says Jaynes, in the space of a single day, whole populations, or what survive of them, are suddenly refugees. Like files of dominoes, anarchy and chaos ripple and lurch across the frightened land as neighbor invades neighbor. And what can the gods say in these ruins? What can the gods say with hunger and death more strict than they, with strange people staring at strange people and strange languages bellowed at uncomprehending ears? Deus, Deus, Zeus, Yahweh, Indra became the new ruling god, an alien god not of this earth, raining terror from the sky. And his thunderbolts became the universal symbol of the power of this heavenly father over the earthly mother. The sky god spoke from on high. He had no need to be heard by our inner ears. He had no need to reach us through the web of life and consciousness that connects us all. So this web began to fray. The newly invented alphabet replaced pictographic writing, rendering culture accessible only through the rational, linear left hemisphere of the brain. The Greek legend of the Titanomachia, the Battle of the Titans, gives a mythologized account of these events, telling how the Olympian gods, led by thunderbolt-wielding Zeus, overthrew and defeated Gaia and her titanic children. Similar tales of cosmic cataclysms are recounted in the Hebrew story of the war in heaven between Yahweh and the rebel angels, the battle of the jinn in Arabia, the Vedas of India, the Greek legends of Atlantis and Phaeton, and the Norse myth of Ragnarok, in Egyptian stories of heavenly battles among Osiris, Set, Horus, and Sekhmet. The Dorians invading Greece called the next 500 years the Age of Heroes. Historians call it the Dark Age of Greece. The consciousness of Gaia may have been given a considerable blow, a knockout punch through these events and the long, cold millennia of the Iron Age and the modern era. From the continuing invasions and wars of conquest among vying empires that characterize all these ages since, including the Crusades, the Plague, the Inquisition, the revolutions and civil wars through the Nazi exterminations and the world wars of the 20th century, Gaia has been in a state of mental and soul illness that in an individual woman would be called post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This illness is characterized by dissociation, the inability of the central part of an individual's waking consciousness to access other essential parts. Inside of each of us are dissociated parts of Gaia's spirit waiting to be healed back into the whole get back to uh, Miguel Seguet's uh, in, uh, inclusion in this. The world age that witnessed this sad process began around the year 3114 BCE. It was the fifth and final world age in a sequence of five. Each of the first four had lasted 5,200 tons, and this last one was also going to last the same amount of time. Curiously, the seventh Bacton witnessed a particular resurgence of philosophical thought and visioning, which somehow brought a ray of light into a quickly darkening world. 
During this period of 400 years, from 747 BC to 553 BC, brilliant humans surfaced in various parts of the world and raised their voices in protest against the senselessness that seemed to rule the era and suggested reason, justice, and mercy. It is almost as if the fifth world age paused at its midpoint and humanity gave birth to its great prophets. The seventh Bactan sits exactly at the midpoint of the 13 Bactan long world age period. The seventh Bactan saw the birth and teachings of people such as Buddha in India, Confucius and Lao Tse in China, Zoroaster in Persia, Socrates in Greece, and probably Quetzalcoatl in Central America. It is inevitable that some of these great prophets of the seventh Bactan were likely to have been women, but the names of these women are lost to us due to the prejudicial historical record keeping of the era. In any case, never before had great minds like this risen to demonstrate the way to an alternative life path, and I feel that it was the Earth Mother speaking through the voice of enlightened individuals, and they were not to be the last. In fact, the seventh Bactan was the beginning of an almost imperceptible and important trend. It was a trend that somehow grew quietly in the corners of the world, picking up strength, growing in followers gently, riding the wave of antagonism and hate, almost like a light feather upon the terrible wind of a destructive storm. It floated and survived. The message of love, of compassion, was often temporarily lost in the tumult. Even those who claimed to follow the teachings of the great minds often were lost in the whirlwind of the storm and replaced much of the original message. Then the message seemed to be revived in another place, another time. The message persisted by a messiah in Galilee centuries later, by solemn lamas in Tibet centuries after that, and so on and so forth. The little flame of compassion that had been kindled during the seventh Bactan somehow continued to glow and kept coming back to life, no matter how much the priests of the new order attempted to snuff it out. It is as if that little flame that held the hope of a return to the ancient covenant was waiting for just the right moment, just the right encouragement to leap up in a conflagration that could blaze forth and sweep away once and for all the rule of the tyrants. What was needed was a combination of two things, a new surge of technological breakthroughs such as the one that had fed the original revolution of spiritual publication of the year 24,000 BCE, and an intact source of ancient spiritual tradition which could utilize that technology for widespread dissemination. This combination surfaced around the year 1992. At that time, the fifth world age embarked on its 20th and final period of 20 tons, the final katun from 1992 to 2012. The beginning of this period coincided with the culmination of just the right elements to recreate the revolution of the year 24,000 BCE. Breakthroughs in communication gradually transformed the means for publication of thoughts and ideas back into the hands of philosophers, idealists, dreamers, and shamans. The sacred traditions of surviving earth-based cultures were brought to the forefront after centuries of ridicule and derision. These traditions provided the new dreamers and idealists with the raw material for new dreams and new ideas. Slowly, the priests of the new order began to lose their strong stranglehold on the means of publication, and alternate thoughts began to be shared. Other messages began to be heard. Other art was experienced. The catalyst for this process was the seeds of compassion sown by the prophets of the seventh Bactan and the later reapers of their tradition. It was the time for the proud Isamye to be toppled from his arrogant perch. And that is Miguel Saguet. Earth-centered spirituality is nothing new, even in the era of Western domination. It has awakened in 60-year cycles back at least to the Italian Renaissance of the 1480s. These include the age of exploration in the 1540s, the English Renaissance in the 1600s, the scientific revolution in the 1660s, the European Enlightenment of the 1720s, the French and American revolutions in the 1780s, the transcendentalist movement of the 1840s, the fin de siècle of the 1900s, and the psychedelic 60s, which saw the dawn of the current neo-pagan resurgence. 
In each of these cycles, certain common themes emerged, foremost among them being a romantic resurrection of classical pagan themes in the arts, poetry, music, literature, drama, ritual, and spirituality. And the return of the goddess was a major focus of artists and poets who claimed her patronage as muse. Now, in anticipation of the next cycle, in the 2020s, the wheel is turning again, and consciousness of the goddess is re-emerging throughout the world. 3,600 years ago, human consciousness was dissociated from the functioning right hemisphere that was in tune with all and the vehicle of the consciousness of Gaia herself. For all these millennia, we have developed an exclusively left hemisphere culture enforced by alphabetical writing requiring the use of only the right hand. But the ambidextrous coordination required for modern computer consoles is, I believe, expanding our corpus callosi and stimulating not only a reawakening of the dormant right hemisphere of humanity, but a full synchronization of both forms of mentality into a new ambidextrous consciousness that will be able to once again sustain the imminent global consciousness of Gaia. Teilhard de Chardin proposed in The Phenomenon of Man a future coalescence of planetary consciousness, which he equated with the second coming of Christ. Noting the diversification of life forms throughout the evolutionary history of Earth, Chardin referred to the genesis of life as the alpha point, and thus the anticipated completion of what he discerned as the entire purpose of evolution, the planetarization of consciousness, he called the omega point. Perhaps the emergence and rapid evolution of the internet and the world wide web are already providing the seeds of a technological newosphere of global consciousness through which this awakening will inevitably manifest. We might equate such an event with the awakening of consciousness in our own minds as the billions of neurons in our brains link up synergistically. And just so shall we participate in the awakening of Gaia herself and our full apotheosis. According to Jose Arguelles, the 1987 harmonic convergence began the final 25-year countdown to the end of the Mayan long count in 2012, which would be the end of history and the beginning of a new 5,184-year cycle. Evils of the modern world, such as war, materialism, violence, abuses, injustice, oppression, etc., would end with the end of the fifth sun on December 21st of 2012. So the 25,920 year long, long count calendar of the Mayans with its division into five world ages, which records one full precessional cycle of the Earth's axis among the stars, will finally reach its end on this year's winter solstice. And the calendar for 2012 that I have up on my wall will also come to an end on December 31st. But when a calendar ends, you don't burn down the house or blow up the planet. You just take it down and put up a new one. And the fun thing about putting up a new calendar is that you get to decide what it will look like. Shall it be a calendar featuring images of cats, dragons, babes, racing cars, wizards, spaceships, Hubble telescope photos? Shall it list secular or religious holidays, birthdays of movie stars, full moons and sabbats? Each time we put up a new calendar, we get to choose for another year. And so it is with the new calendar we get to choose for the next Bakhtan, world age, or astrological aeon. The possibilities are limitless. And as always, at such transitional times, we have the opportunity to choose foolishly or wisely. I believe, however, that most people on Earth hold certain dreams and visions in common. Dreams of freedom, liberation, personal empowerment, peace, harmony, love, balance, hope, prosperity, happy children, and a healthy planet. Dreams of harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding. No more falsehoods or derision, golden living dreams of vision, mystic crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation. And sunrise, 
on the morning of December 22nd will be literally the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Astrological attributes of Aquarius include enlightenment, the revelation of truth, and the expansion of consciousness. While the symbol and sacrament of Aquarius is obviously water, the universal medium of life, water shared is life shared, Aquarius is an air sign, signifying communication, networking, ideas, wisdom, air travel, and even space travel and colonization as we embark upon the great diaspora of humankind, Gaia's progeny among the stars. And most importantly, the coalescence of consciousness on a global scale, the awakening of Gaia. And just like the last time around, 26,000 years ago, we can expect a new creative explosion such as the world has not seen since the Ice Age. And a final note from Miguel Seguet. It is interesting to discover that at this present point in time, here at the very end of the 260 century cycle, humanity is undergoing a similar revolution. The present day explosion in accessible media and communication has brought the means of publication and information dissemination back into the hands of the philosopher and the metaphysical explorer, the present day shaman. Whereas this access to media had been limited for centuries by to a privileged few with dubious or outright malevolent agendas, it now is again accessible to those for whom it was originally meant. This revolution is almost identical in character to the one that happened 260 centuries ago. Again, as in that distant Ice Age era, the means for publishing the genuine internal human spiritual experience, the means of sharing that powerful essence of the soul, which all humans need to share, is accessible to those who are most fit to work with it. It has happened through a revolution of technology, very much like the revolutionizing of media technology that took place in 24,000 BCE. Over the past quarter century, I have traveled throughout the world, meeting with magical practitioners and indigenous tribal elders and shamans of many lands and cultures. And the subject of Mother Earth and her awakening has been a constant theme of our conversations. I have never encountered so widespread a paradigm among wise ones everywhere as that of the imminent awakening of global consciousness. In all those with whom I have discussed the coming prophetic date of Winter Solstice 2012 agree that it is a perfect time to synchronize a vast global meditation and magical working to catalyze this coalescence of consciousness. What shall we choose, apocalypse or apotheosis? And therefore, I propose to all pagans, witches, wizards, shamans, magicians, and visionaries the creation of a global grand cone of power ritual similar to the 1987 Harmonic Convergence, whose focus on world peace catalyzed the ending of the Cold War. Just so do I propose a vast global unified visioning meditation on winter solstice of this year to catalyze the awakening of Gaia. I urge all magical people everywhere to begin conceptualizing the structure and contents of this working and writing poetry, songs, and meditations for it. I will be assembling a collection of search liturgical materials myself, as well as a full-scale ritual, which people may utilize if they choose, on my personal website, oberonzell.com. Also, Gene Houston has created a major networking organization to coordinate a worldwide awakening to commence at dawn of December 22nd, the opening moment of the new age of Aquarius. Join the SHIFT network at Shift, shiftmovement.com and on the morning on the dawning of December 22nd I propose we all go out and greet the rising sun with the playing and singing of the song this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius and as that song reverberates around the world as the sunrise blankets the earth a great unified visioning will help us to create a focused global meditation so pass the word this is your wake-up call. <laughs>